Hey everyone, welcome to Persona Marketing, the key to brand relevance. My name is Michael Brito. I will be facilitating the next 30 minutes or so as we talk about using data to drive more relevant and actionable personas. Now, just really quick, a little bit about me. I am the global head of analytics at Xeno Group. We are an integrated agency and we work with a variety of clients across B2B, healthcare, as well as consumer brands. I also teach at San Jose State University. I teach a class to undergrad and grad students who are majoring in PR, marketing, advertising, and I, I essentially show them how to use social media from a business standpoint because they're already doing it very well uh, for themselves. So I do that, also talk a lot about data and the importance of using data to drive smarter decision-making. And then I am also a YouTuber and content creator. Yes, I did go there. Please like, comment, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm kidding. Um, I actually started a YouTube channel in 2020 as a goal to overcome a lack of confidence and on being video, on being on video. And uh, here I am like 80 videos later and I love it. So that's me. I've been in this space for many years, worked for on the client side, as well as um, on, the, on, the, on the, the agency side. And I've always been um, very confident in using data to not just you know, peel back the onion and, and dig and try to find insights that can inform some type of program, uh, but also cursory data to really you know, make quick, actionable, and agile decisions. So today we're gonna talk about personas in general. And it, it's kind of an outdated term, but the reality is is that personas still matter. Whether you call it a buyer persona, a consumer, uh, a marketing persona, or an audience persona. I actually prefer to call them audience personas. Whatever you call them, it's it's basically a way to visualize who your audience is. Now, just a quick, a few data points here, just to kind of talk through from eMarketer and Content Marketing Institute and others, is that 60% of B2B enterprise marketers um, said they do use data and research to develop personas. That's a good thing. 60% in B2B, uh, not sure about consumer or healthcare, healthcare or public sector or other verticals, but B2B, it's, it's definitely a good sign. 73% of B2B marketers are planning to use buyer personas for marketing in 2020. So this was um, about a year old. And so who knows if that ever happened or not. And then 47% of companies who exceeded revenue goals report themselves to be consistently effective at maintaining personas. I've consulted with companies where they would say, you know what, we have 15 personas that were done by 15 different groups, help us. And you know, I just envision a bunch of people in a conference room on a whiteboard saying, hmm, who is our client? Who is our customer? It's Jane. She is you know, between 35 and 49 with three kids, college educated, household income of this, shops at Whole Foods and works out on a Peloton and all these other things. And um, it's all based on intuition and or desire. Like who do they desire their audiences to be? Um, it very rarely ever uh, includes data on who the audience actually is. Okay, so uh, a lot of audience personas are built using primary research, which is great. That's one one kind of data point. I'm here to talk to you about a few other ways to do that. So there's, you know, personas is definitely part of the conversation, part of the budget, but um, this is a more recent study from the Content Marketing Institute. 63% of marketers surveyed change their messaging in response to the pandemic. That's that's a good thing, right? I mean, the the way that the consumer journey happened and, you know, no longer are you, you know, retailers suffered obviously. So a lot of marketers kind of jumped back into the their their messaging and their targeting and overall marketing in general to make some tweaks, make sense. Far fewer took actions such as revisiting customer personas and changing their content marketing metrics, okay? That troubles me because the, the 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 landscape is changing regardless of the pandemic consumer behavior is changing the social kind of the ecosystem the psychology of how we use social media and content changes all the time so if you're not if you're waiting for the pandemic or some crazy thing to happen before you go back and check your personas or your metrics etc then there's a problem you should be looking at this all the time in fact i would suggest to clients that you know Six months at a minimum, you should go back and redo a persona analysis. Even if you know you only do one primary research study and use that for a year, maybe two, but you can go back and use uh, social analytics as a, and other kind of forms of audience data to start to inform 
uh, you know, and give a more detailed view and perspective of who your audience is. I wanted to show this slide because, you know, this, this shows the complexity of the buyer's journey and it's never going to be linear. And in fact, the way that I displayed this is more about the sales funnel, right? Looking from awareness down to advocacy, there's kind of push marketing, pull marketing. And if you've taken any marketing class ever in undergrad or grad school or read a book, you've heard of push and pull marketing. And I, I like to show this because this is like what we think, right? This is this was for a campaign and we had put together what a buyer's journey might look like and all of the elements of the campaign that we are launching in hopes to kind of visually show how a particular audience would in fact uh, engage, right? And how you would reach them with repetitive and consistent storytelling across, you know, paid media, earned media, YouTube videos, paid search, Google, you know, um, SEO, um, other forms of engagement like Reddit conversations and Twitter, et cetera. So this, it's complex and it's never the same twice, right? We, we go through the buyer's journey, um, our own buyer's journey. I mean, it would be difficult for you to kind of calculate how you buy products because it's different every time. So uh, I, I say all this because there's, there's a better way to do this. And this is what we're going to spend the next, I don't know, 20 minutes or so talking through a few different personas on the consumer side, on the B2B side, that that is is based on real data and is 100% actionable, whether you work in PR, media relations, whether you're in demand gen, lead gen, paid media, display advertising, or you're in market research and you're trying to get more consumer insights to better understand who your customer is in order to create programs that are more relevant and aligned to their, their values. So before I do that, though, I want to talk about this idea around audience demand. Now, this is a model that we put together, and it is meant to showcase how you can use data, anal data analysis to uncover the topics, the trends, and the stories that are demanding the attention of your audience. Because it's no longer about demographics, right? I mean, I say that very loosely. There are demographic factors important. But not all 45-year-olds do the same thing, share the same thing, or talk about the same thing. But if you have other parameters that are relevant to your audience to understand like what's top of mind for them, what do they care about? Are they in the market for re, you know, um, refinancing their home? Are they in the market for a Fitbit or a smart wa smartwatch? Are they trying to buy a new home or a new house? Are they in the market for new software? So this model based on supply and demand basically will tell us those those stories, those brand affinities, those topics that are demanding their attention. And then we have to ask ourselves, okay, if this is what our audience cares about, and by the way, let me just quickly say, the audience could be, depending upon who you are, it could be a variety of different things. It could be to the point of this slide, traditional media, if you work in PR, your audience is tradi traditional media. It could be specific journalists or the top 25 fashion journalists, top 100 you know, tech journalists, that is your audience. In if you work in influencer marketing or some form of marketing function, you may be responsible for an influencer program. That is your audience, right? You are trying to be relevant and understand an audience in order to build a program and activate them so that they can influence your customers. And then if you work in marketing many times, it's it's the audience groups. It is your target audience. It is IT decision makers. It is CIOs. It is architects. It is physicians or HCPs, or it's millennials in Portland who wear Birkenstocks and don't wear deodorant. There are so many different, obviously everybody has their own audience. Uh, you know, if you, if you're Gillette and you sell deodorant, then that very well could be an audience that you're trying to reach in Portland. So that is the audience side, right? That is the demand that is the analysis of the audience demand. Now you have to ask yourselves, okay, are we meeting the demand of our audience with our supply of content? Okay, so when, when you look to the left here, you see owned content, earned content, and social content. Now they typically line up, right? If, if you work in PR and you wanna understand what is top of mind for traditional media when they're writing about 5G, and you are a mobile phone company or a carrier, then you're gonna to wanna to do an analysis on your earned media coverage to see, is my supply of content through earned media meeting the demand of the larger traditional media landscape? 
okay? Because if it isn't, then there's a huge disconnect. But if you work in marketing, as an example, you might do an analysis of IT decision makers, and one of the the insights from that analysis could be that IT, you know, top of mind for IT right now is remote work, right? And and maybe that's not top of mind anymore, but it was back in March, April of 2020 when everybody was working from home, security, devices, all that thing, all of that. Now, then if you're a security company, you might be doing analysis on your owned content, which is your blogs and communities and forums. You might also do an analysis on the content that you're publishing in social media to include organic and paid social. And you might find that the stories and content that you're publishing does not match what's top of mind for the audience. That is extremely actionable, right? Because then you can, if you understand what those stories are, what those keywords and phrases are, you can start to adapt what you have control over, like social content, like owned content. You can adapt that, that you know, your go-to-market strategy so that you can meet the demand of the audience. So I hope that makes sense because we're now going to do some analysis. I'm going to show you some analysis of, uh, you know, particular audience groups. Now, this is... I've seen this before, actually, on a slide uh, where I was in a, it, it was a couple years, like five years ago, and it, it was literally this slide, same photo, just different age group, different name, different, you know, websites and journals and publications. And, you know, this is the result of a bunch of marketing folks in a conference room, um, you know, looking at third party primary, re primary research or secondary research and ass making assumptions, right? how do you know what the frustrations are, right? You don't know what the frustrations are unless you actually analyze the conversations of your audience and determine that, yes, in fact, this, that, and this are frustrations of the audience. So I'm not, I'm kind of poking fun, you know, honestly, and, I'm, and, and I realize that, that, you know, as an industry, we have a long, long way to go. But you could download a template like this uh, anywhere, right? You go to Google and type in audience persona template, click on images, and you will see hundreds, if not thousands of templates with random people. And she's a real person. She's in, you know, obviously talent somewhere, but uh, you, you'll see a multitude of these personas. Now, to bring it back here on, on audience personas, you know, we've, we, we, there's templates that you can use. And if you, you know, if you add real data to it, then that's great. Right. So I'm, 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 kind of making fun at the word template. Um, and, and template is just the way that you visualize the, the content. I'm more concerned about the data source, right? Where do you get these ideas from? How do you know what the personalities are? How do you know what their, what their motivations and, and their, you know, their top technology interests and, you know, what media publications they're reading? How do you know that, right? Is it because you Googled, you know, what do millennials read? What are the top millennial business publications or what's top of mind for millennials. We know that social, um, uh, you know, so, social justice is top of mind for a lot of people, but like for years, they've always been one of those generations that focus on like values, like, like what the brands that I buy must align to the values that matter to me. So th those are all kind of duh, like we know that, but what else can you uncover using social data to inform how you create these personas? Now, before I jump into the personas, and I promise you the next five slides will be real personas, let me just say like a persona is no good if it just sits in a PowerPoint presentation and, and doesn't get evangelized internally and used to create programs. That's the whole point of this is it's, it's, it's like a creative brief. If you send your personas to your agency, they should be able, to, along with the creative brief, they should be able to create a campaign that is relevant to the audience, that is aligned to your business and will reach the audience in the channels, media publications, uh, et cetera, that they spend time with and they have an affinity for. So, all right, so let's jump into it and get into the first persona of Ana Cisneros. And yes, that is not a real name. Well, it it's a combination of a name of two people that I know. I took one first name and a last name because I couldn't think of anything else. But um, she's not a real person. You know, she's not a marketing director in Chicago. Uh, she's not single. She didn't grow up in LA, go to USC. All of that is made up. Right, that is something that, as a way to contextualize the data, that is made up. Everything else on here is based using real data. Now, there's a lot of audience platforms out there, and I one of my favorites is Audience, spelled with an S, and they are an audience intelligence platform that looks and helps build 
these personas. And these personas, again, you know, th this isn't like an output. You know, I didn't export the dashboard, you know, that exports look different than what I like to do. I, I like to build my own color codes and, and you know, I I'm great in PowerPoint. I want to make sure it matches, you know, client colors and things like that. But let me just talk about a couple of these things going from left to right, starting with preferred channels. Um, you know, these are the top six channels that they're using. Um, and so now we know exactly where we might want to think about activating some type of program or programs on these channels. Um, the top interests, you know, health, fitness, sports, athletics, travel, new society. Now there's a lot of way to build uh, audiences, right? You can type in, you know, very broad parameters and it kicks back multiple segments. Uh, or, you know, if you know that, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to, you're pitching a company and they are in the fitness industry, you might create your own parameters like, you know, women 35 to 49, you know, interested in travel, sports, fitness. And this is the type of data that you get back. So we know that health and fitness is that is, and sports and athletics are top interests, but they're also interested in travel news and, and larger societal issues. Now, again, not too actionable, but let's move down to the brand affinities, right? So these are brand affinities, and this is based on the percent of the audience that follows these brands. So a high percentage of the audience that we built uh, follows Lululemon, Whole Foods, Nike, ClassPass, et cetera. We can also see from a fitness and, and, uh, and trade media standpoint, they read Women's Health, Fitness Magazine, Pop Sugar, New York Times Health. So immediately, if you work in PR, you know you, you probably have a light bulb that's going off. You can start to think about prioritizing certain publications based on the affinities of this audience. Moving down to top influencers, these are people that are influenced that are influencing our audience of fitness professionals. In this case, you know these on a Cisneros, and so these are you know again some of these are fitness influencers, like you could probably find them in some type of influencer marketing, you know, discovery tool. But a lot of times when you do it that way, it's not, there's a disconnect because in this case, we're looking at the percent of th this audience that follows these influencers. So we're seeing Tara Styles, Rachel Zoe. These are people that you can potentially partner with or pay if, if, you know, um, you know, there's an influencer marketing component to this program. Moving on to purchase influence factors, right? These, this is how they are, how they are influenced to purchase products, right? Family and friends, 70% are influenced by friends, family. If it's a B2B audience, colleagues and, and, and third, you know, and peers, um, 61% brand names. These are the brand loyalist, 58% product utility. So this, again, it's all based on affinity based data. What percent of different audiences are following um, different brands, influencers, and social media channels. Now, this is another look at the same data, right? So we're on the left, it's, you know, it's it's Anna again, not the same person, a different segment. They prefer movies and TV, health, fitness, sports, education. So slightly different interest areas. This is helpful if you want to align your content and narrative to, to some of the interests that your audience cares about. The fitness affinities, brand affinities, and influencers are the same in terms of how it's calculated, but this segment, they're actually different people, right? You have Runner's World, you have Health Magazine, and the influencers are completely different than the influencers from the other segment. On the right, you have a topical conversation analysis. These are the conversations that this that this audience is having publicly on social media. So, you know, when you think about fitness, and, and by the way, I did this analysis, so I know, this was a conversation that they we wanted to understand what they were saying about overall working out and fitness. And I, at first I thought, okay, they're going to be talking about abs and, you know, gains and looking good and, you know, all this. It was less about that. It was really about connection. It was connection. It was building community. It was seeing friends and family and working out together. It was, it was maintaining a healthy and a life um, exercise. And, you know, a lot of the, the audiences were, um, you know, going through anxiety. This was during COVID. So they would look at working out as a way to release the stress, you know, so family, friends, connections. This was very insightful because not only do we have their brand affinities and media affinities, but we know what topics are demanding the attention of that audience. And we did a very similar analysis here for IT decision makers. This is Sarah Nix. 46, head of IT infrastructure in Palo Alto, senior job, Java developer, blah, 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 blah. 
we can see what her channels are, right? She's big into Pinterest, right? She is also nine times more likely to use LinkedIn than the, the business index. And we like to compare audiences to gen pop, but we don't just build a gen pop that is, you know, um, any random sample of, of internet users on social media. We like to build a random, we like to build other audiences as kind of a general pop for business. So we have a, we have a basically an audience of coordinators, managers, directors across, you know, marketing, PR, finance, supply chain, customer support, you know, all, you know, operations. And we compare our, our B2B audiences against this business index so that we can start to see how unique the audience is when you compare it to the average business person, right? So it's kind of like Gen Pop, but a little bit more focused on the business environment. Now, in this case, from a media affinity standpoint, they are nine times more likely to read Wired, eight times more likely to read Gizmodo, Medium, The Verge, and Digital Trends. So again, if you work in a technology company, these are the top media publications that are that these um, IT decision makers follow. Now, one thing that I've found is that not all, just because a, a particular audience group follows a media publication doesn't necessarily mean that they read it or share it. So part of the analysis on the right could include, not in this case, could include the, the um, URLs that are being shared by the audience. So we can extract you know, any articles, any keywords that were shared from The Verge, from New York Times, from every publication that you can think of. So you can start to correlate, okay, affinity-based data versus share-based data or uh, conversational-based data and start to see how, how in many cases they're aligned and in other cases they're very different. And there's so many variables as to why that might happen, right? Forbes publishes a thousand articles a day and Wired publishes five articles a day, as an example. That could be why the sharing data is different, right? So again, there's a lot of things to consider here and, and you know, 70% of any analytics project should be human curated. So you'll get those insights by having your team or analyst team really dig into the data. One other thing before we jump into the topical relevance is the software purchase factors. Now, this was a, in this case, we had essentially came based on our hypothesis. There were, these were five reasons why an IT decision maker might purchase software. And so what we did is we built uh, very complex Boolean strings and we looked at their conversations over the past 18 months and plotted all those conversations based on performance, mobility, security, utility, and design. And we were able to, to, to really pinpoint the, 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 the topical, well, the relevance as to how IT decision makers are buying software. And in this case, the utility of a product is the top followed by security, design, then mobility, and then performance, okay? So this is the IT decision maker, right? It might be different for the buyer or it might be different for a developer who's less about, you know, maybe performance for, uh, you know, as they're writing code and, you know, doing all these other things and listening to Spotify playlists, you know, they're going to want a, a, a platform that's, you know, and a, and a device that is high performing. So again, it might change based on the audience. On the right, these are the things that are relevant to this IT decision maker, data science, insights, cloud, CIO. These are all verbatim keywords that are extracted from their social conversations. So we can also extract uh, hashtags as well. But in this case, we can start to get a feel for when you're, when you're looking at 10,000, you know, uh, social mentions of an audience, you can scroll for 15 minutes and still not understand like what's the context. But when you cluster the conversations in an analysis like this, you can start to say, okay, well, data science is an important topic. Within the topic of data science, there's also deep learning. Within deep learning, there's AI and analytics. So you can start to get a feel for the context by clustering the conversations in this way. And from that standpoint, you can go back to paid search, go back to SEO, go back to social content and say, are we using these, this language, these keywords and phrases in our outbound content? Are we meeting the demand of the audience, right? With our supply of stories, because here's the demand. The demand is right here on the right. That is what's top of mind. Let's create content programs, headlines, blogs, you know, let's make sure we're bidding on all these keywords in search. Let's make sure we're using these this language in our ad copy for paid paid search, paid social, so that we can meet that demand. Now, a couple other slides before we conclude for today. This is what I was talking about earlier, where we talk about 
we build an audience and then we segment the audience because not all IT decision makers are the same, right? There are, there's CIOs, there's head of IT, there's director of IT, VP of IT, there's ops engineers, there's cloud architecture engineers, security engineers, there's DevOps, DevSecOps, InfoSec, and thousands of others. Now, in this case, we're looking at actually someone very different, the commercial real estate agent, right? And so these are um, commercial real estate agents. And what we did is we built an audience of, of you know, based on bio searches, we used audience, the platform to do this. And we were able to segment the audience based on these factors. <clears throat> so with, so within the commercial real estate audience, there are, there's, there's a C-suite, right? There's people who are in charge of very large brokerages. There's investors and venture capitalists who are part of the, the analysis or part of the real estate agent, commercial real estate agent audience. There's actual brokers and managers. And then there's also the reporters and analysts that cover this marketplace. And within each of those, you can analyze and build personas for each one. Like you can build a persona for commercial real estate agents that is the C-suite. You can build a different persona that is investors and VCs and even a different one who are brokers and managers. And on the left, we have media publications, right? Unique media affinities when compared to that business index, which I told you. These are the publications that they read. Now, some of these might not make sense. I don't know off the top of my head what some of these are, like the big S here. Um, uh, they're, they're very much focused on real estate. Uh, you have Commercial Observer, LA Times, Globe something, Wall Street Journal, BizNow. These are very focused and, uh, you know, uh, how would I say this, very relevant to the commercial real estate builder audience. And then oh, Inman is, is one of the big ones. And then unique brand affinity. So these are brands that they have an affinity for. And it could be who they work for, right? CBRE, Colliers, you know, um, Cushman and Wakefield. The, and again, these are, these are very unique. You see those numbers are so high, right? The index numbers, 17 you know, times more likely to follow or engage with Cushman and, and Wakefield because the average business person doesn't do that. Like they have no idea who these other companies are. Um, so that's why this this audience is so unique. And you know, that that is kind of the, <laughs> and that really concludes the the presentation today. And I just wanted to reiterate that, you know, this data is, is all 100% public data. And, you know, people who work in business, whether it's tech or, you know, non-tech, uh, you know, they are not shy on telling you who they are and what they do. For consumer brands, you know, people are very open to telling you, hey, I'm interested in music or I drink IPA beer or I'm a wine aficionado or I'm a travel, I love traveling. Those are all indicators of how you might want to start building an audience. And most of that conversation is on Twitter, but here's, here's, here's what's beautiful about that. Because clients always say, well, it's just Twitter. Well, the sample sizes are in the millions, number one. And it's a good benchmark. Not to mention that according to a couple of studies I've read, if you work in a consumer for a consumer brand and, and obviously Gen Z is an important audience for you, there was a study by, by Twitter internal teams who, uh, from May 2020 to May 2021 that showed that over half of all tweets published were done so from people on Twitter under between the ages of 16 and 24. That is the Gen Z audience. So they're using Twitter. They are engaging with brands. They are using, reading the news. We know millennials, Gen X, and by the way, I'm Gen X. So it, the, nobody, we're like the forgotten generation. Nobody cares about us. But, um, you know, so Twitter is a, a, a more than enough sampling of audiences. It's, it's the only social network that really drives conversation. Everything else is about publishing and comments. This is a conversation that people are having. So I hope this helps. Please consider to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and or Twitter or anywhere else. And yes, my YouTube channel, like, comment, subscribe. Thank you again. I hope this was beneficial to you. Um, please reach out with any questions and have a great rest of your conference. Take care. Bye.